What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Motherland channel. Have you ever imagined the world as you know it flipping upside down? Cities are in chaos, resources are scarce, and every decision you make is a matter of life and death? Now hold that thought. It's easy to think you've got your bases covered with a stockpile of canned chicken and a trusty flashlight. But what if I told you that your biggest threats aren't just the obvious dangers lurking in the shadows, but the assumptions resting in your own mind? That's right. It's the seemingly harmless beliefs and common sense notions that could lead you straight into peril. In the unpredictable whirlwind of an SHTF scenario, the line between staying alive and stepping into danger can be razor thin. In this video, I'll talk about what I believe are the top seven assumptions that, believe it or not, might just be your undoing in a SHTF situation. Buckle up, because what you're about to read could dramatically reshape your survival strategy and maybe, just maybe, save your life when the world goes sideways. Number seven, relying on government rescue. In a world turned topsy-turvy by some catastrophic event, there is a common assumption that might trip you up, thinking Uncle Sam's gonna swoop in and save the day. You know, the whole, the government will bail us out, mindset. But let's get real here. It's not always the case, especially when things hit the fan in a major way. Picture this. A massive disaster has just struck. Chaos reigns supreme. It's natural to think that emergency services, the police, or even the military will come to your rescue. But as much as we'd like to lean on that hope, the truth is a bit more complicated. In a full-blown crisis, those guys are stretched thinner than a dollar store tarp. They've got their hands full, dealing with widespread emergencies and trying to maintain some semblance of order. Now, let's sprinkle in some martial law, a real possibility in dire situations. If that happens, it's a whole new ball game. Authorities might start rationing supplies or even confiscating your carefully hoarded stash. Suddenly, that safe haven you thought you had isn't looking so safe anymore. The takeaway? Don't put all your eggs in the government's basket. Instead, think about forming a solid crew of like-minded folks, a group that's prepped, shares your survival mindset, and is ready to band together when the going gets tough. It's about creating your own safety net because, at the end of the day, relying solely on the government in a SHTF scenario could leave you hanging out to dry. Number six, escaping the danger zone is always the safest option. When the world seems to be going to hell in a handbasket, a lot of us might think, hey, let's just pack up and get the hell out of here. Yeah, bugging out, hitting the road when a disaster hits. But hang on a second because this knee-jerk reaction to flee the scene might not be the golden ticket to safety you think it is. Let's break it down. The whole concept of bugging out sounds pretty straightforward, right? Just grab your bug out bag and head for the hills. But in the real world, when everyone and their cousin has the same idea, things get messy fast. Picture the highways, they're jammed worse than during a holiday weekend. And while you're stuck in that snail-paced traffic, guess what? You're vulnerable. Easy pickings for anyone with less than honorable intentions. But wait, there is more. Say you do manage to weave your way through the chaos and reach your secret hideout in the woods. Guess what you've left behind? Your home base, your stockpile of supplies, all those canned goods and gallons of water you've been hoarding for just this sort of scenario. In the rush to get out, you've potentially given up your fortress for a tent. So, what's the better move? Well, it's not a one-size-fits-all kind of deal. The real trick is to read the room, or in this case, the situation. Don't just jump in the car, the second thing looks dicey. Number five, neglecting the importance of a solid community. When the world's thrown a curveball and everything's in disarray, it's not just about finding folks to hunker down with, it's about what glues your group together. A lot of folks might think, hey, as long as we've got a bunch of people together, we're good. But hold your horses because there is a lot more to it than just numbers. In the thick of a crisis, having a crew is crucial, but the real champ? Shared values. It's not just about pooling resources or swapping skills, it's about being on the same page, having that common ground. Think about it. You're in this intense pressure cooker situation. If you're not vibing with the people around you, things can go south real quick. It's like this. Imagine you're in a band, everyone's playing different tunes, and nobody's listening to each other. That's not music, that's just noise. 
The same goes for a post-disaster community. You can have all the supplies in the world, but if there is no harmony in how you use them, what's the point? So, what's the game plan? Start by connecting with people who share your outlook on things. These are folks who get what's at stake and are ready to work together like a well-oiled machine. Build relationships, establish trust, and set some ground rules. This isn't about finding a bunch of randoms to pass the time with. It's about building a community that stands the test of time and trouble. Number four, embracing a lone wolf survival approach. All right, let's chat about going solo in an SHTF scenario. You know, the whole lone wolf approach. It's easy to think, I'll just take care of myself and avoid all the drama. But here's the deal. Flying solo in a disaster situation is like trying to play a football game all by yourself. Sure, you might dodge a few tackles, but eventually, you're gonna get blindsided. In the thick of a crisis, you might reckon you're better off on your own. Less noise, less hassle, right? But here is the kicker. There is strength in numbers. Think about all the things you need to cover. Finding food, keeping watch, medical care, heck, even building a shelter. That's a lot for one person to juggle. It's like trying to juggle chainsaws. Sooner or later, you're bound to drop one. Now, I'm not saying you need to be the mayor of a post-apocalyptic town, but linking up with a few trustworthy souls can make a world of difference. It's about sharing the load, having each other's backs. Say you twist your ankle or come down with a nasty bug. Going it alone suddenly doesn't seem so smart. But here's the catch. It's not just about finding any old group. It's about connecting with folks who've got skills that complement yours. Maybe you're a whiz at finding food, and someone else is a pro at first aid. Together, you're a dynamic duo. Number three, risky drinking water sources. All right, let's talk about water. We all know it's essential, but in a SHTF situation, playing fast and loose with your H2O isn't just risky, it's potentially deadly. You might think, Hey, this water looks clear, must be good to go, right? Wrong. That's like judging a book by its cover. Sometimes what's inside is a whole different story. Here's the thing. Just because water looks clean doesn't mean it's safe to drink. It's like looking at a used car that's shiny on the outside. Sure, it looks great, but you don't know what kind of problems are lurking under the hood. Same goes for water during a crisis. It might be clear but it could be teeming with bacteria or other nasties that could knock you off your feet or worse. So, what's the move? First off, don't even think about drinking directly from a natural source or a tap in some abandoned building. It's like playing Russian roulette with your health. Instead, get smart about water purification. We're talking water filters, purification tablets, even boiling if you've got the means. It's like having a safety net for your stomach. And hey, let's not forget about rainwater harvesting. It's a nifty trick to collect and purify rainwater. It's like setting up your own personal water station. No more taking chances with dodgy sources. Number two, overly friendly interactions with other survivors. In the middle of an SHTF scenario, it's natural to want to help others. We're all in this mess together, right? But here is a bit of tough love. Being too chummy with other survivors can backfire big time. It's like opening your doors for a party and suddenly realizing you can't get the guests to leave. Let's break it down. You're out there, doing your best to survive, and you come across folks who are struggling. Your heart says, hey, let's help them out. But your head needs to be a bit more cautious. See, sharing your supplies might seem like the neighborly thing to do, but it can set a dangerous precedent. Once word gets out that you're the go-to for handouts, you might find a line forming at your door. And not everyone in that line will take no for an answer. <laughs> now, I'm not saying to turn a cold shoulder to everyone. It's about striking that delicate balance. Being kind-hearted is one thing, but in a world where resources are as scarce as hen's teeth, you've got to think about survival first. It's like being on a plane, you've got to put on your own oxygen mask before helping others. Here is the skinny. Helping others can quickly turn into a liability. When people get desperate, they can flip from grateful to greedy in the blink of an eye. Before you know it, you're dealing with folks who feel entitled to your hard-earned stash. And that's a recipe for trouble. Number one, overlooking minor wounds. And finally, let's talk about those tiny scratches, cuts, wounds, scrapes, bruises, etc. When you're knee deep in a survival situation, it's easy to brush those off. After all, 
When you're worried about finding your next meal or keeping safe, who cares about a small injury, right? Wrong. In the rough and tumble world of SHTF scenarios, ignoring those minor injuries is like ignoring a small leak in your roof. Sure, it seems trivial now, but give it time and you'll have a whole new world of problems. Here is the lowdown. In the comfort of everyday life, a tiny cut is no biggie. Slap on a band-aid and you're good to go. But in a survival situation, that little cut could be your downfall. Why? Because even the most minor injuries can get infected fast. And without the luxuries of modern medicine at your fingertips, an infection can go from bad to worse in a jiffy. Now, you might think it's tough to prioritize a scratch when you're playing Survivor in real life, but trust me, it's essential. Think of it like this. You're your own best asset in these situations. Keeping yourself in tip-top shape is key to making it through. Stocking up on first aid supplies is a must. We're talking antiseptics, bandages, and yes, antibiotics if you can get your hands on them. And it's not just about having these supplies. Knowing how to use them correctly is also key. And that's it for this video. If it was helpful or entertaining, please click on the like, share, and subscribe buttons. And click on the notification bell too while you're at it. Thanks for watching, and God bless America. God bless America.